This is David Ross, and welcome once again to the Lions Roar podcast. What I wanted to talk about um, today was what I think is um, an important relationship and um, should be seen as a uh, potential partnership between Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Chui Jiao. Um, but already I need to clarify that. Um, when we talk about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, I, I'm talking much more about the original Gracie family Jiu-Jitsu as opposed to the um, more modern aspects of it, which has become a little bit more, um, I'm loath to use the term, but sport-oriented and International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation competition-oriented, um, moving away a little bit from the emphasis of the original Gracie family and their particular emphasis on um, not just the rolling, which has become the sport, but the self-defense aspects and the Valley Tudo or, or challenge aspects. Um, by the same motion, uh, same meaning, when I talk about uh, Shui Zhao, um, I, I'm talking here about um, specifically the Shui Zhao that I, I do and a lot of people do, which is from uh, Chang Dong Sheng's lineage, which is a form of Bao Ding, but you know, Bao Ding school, but is, um, you know, very importantly, Chang Dong Sheng's only own personal experiences and the way that he developed. Um, his method and so that's what we're going to talk about today so again um, talking about uh, Gracie family jiu-jitsu or Gracie jiu-jitsu as, as it was known um, you know this complication arising from you know in the 90s um, some legal disputes that resulted in using the term Brazilian jiu-jitsu um, and the Cheng Dong Sheng version of Shui Zhao and like I said you know uh, when we talk about Shui Zhao of course there's classical Shui Zhao um, I don't know why recently it's been a, a big subject of discussion, but um, if we use wrestling in a generic term, um, wrestling has existed in China for a very, very long time under different names and in different formats, and some of it more uh, martial than others. When we talk about Shui Zhao now, we're talking about um, classical Shui Zhao, a form of standing grappling with no groundwork with its origins in what they was called the Shampuying, which was um, in, with the Manchurian, the Qing Dynasty, um, a, a group that was started. And one of their primary uses, as I've discussed before, was a, a kind of diplomacy where the Manchurian wrestlers engaged in wrestling matches with um, Mongolian wrestlers. But we already know that Shampuying is not a com- you know, completely non-martial um, they were bodyguards, um, and especially once the Shampuyin broke up and they went out into the, the regular world, um, they were part of the Jiang He, you know, the subculture. Um, they had schools and, you know, did performances on the streets and, you know, um, had to defend their territories. Um, and, and just in general, we know the wrestlers are, are very tough people. But when we talk about Chang Dong Sheng, first we're talking about the Bao Ding School. Now, um, Definitely a direct relationship between the Baoding school and the Shampuying, but um, Baoding is already um, somewhat differentiated from other classical schools of Shui Zhao. And, you know, like for example, Shui Zhao that we see on the mainland um, and see him published in books and videos from the mainland because the basically grandfather, godfather of Baoding said that he included uh, Shaolin Chuen um, into the system. And of course, you know, being clear here, it, Shaolin Chuen is sort of a generic name for the kind of long arm, long fist methods, um, you know, in Hubei and Hunan and, you know, that surrounding area. But it was already somewhat different. Um, but with Cheng Dong Sheng, of course, we know that his Shui Zhao is not only Bao Ding, but it's also uh, greatly influenced by his training and teaching at the Central Guoshu Academy and by his experience um, preparing, you know, military and police. And it makes it very different, and we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, we talk about Gracie family jiu-jitsu, or Gracie jiu-jitsu, as I said. Um, again, somewhat controversial, but probably less controversial now. There's some very good stuff um, coming out about this uh, closed guard project, which is like books and a documentary and some blog posts and stuff that you can read. Um, it's not as much jiu-jitsu in the classical jiu-jitsu terms, you know, that if we think about, like, you know, jiu-jitsu that was done by samurai, you know, 
uh, you know, warriors in armor, but it's more pre-war judo, and that's going to be important as I talk more about why I think um, there is an inherent relationship and a good possibility to cross-train between Shui Zhao and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Um, Kano, among his many um, brilliant innovations in the way that he was able to take a relatively obscure, um, unpopular Japanese martial art and turn into a internationally practiced and respected sport was establishing uh, ethical standards and his concern for their reputation. Um, it is often stated in histories of judo that when Kano was doing jiu-jitsu, um, it was no longer obviously being practiced by uh, you know, samurai, by you know, uh, elite caste warriors. It had sort of filtered down into the general population. It was often affiliated or uh, had a reputation of being affiliated with you know, gangsters, thugs, and toughs. And so one of the things that Kano wanted to do was to sort of rehabilitate that reputation. And keeping that in mind, um, you know, there's, there's always tensions about this because, you know, even under Kano's leadership, they did some challenge matches. Um, the police college matches, you know, probably stand out the most. But a lot of people that were training under him or were affiliated with him were still sort of engaging in uh, challenge matches, wanting to prove... Uh, the method. Um, so you had people like, you know, uh, Kande Koma, Count Combat, Meta, you know, who, uh, and there were, he was not the only one, clearly. We, we know in, in Europe and in, you know, uh, the Americas, people affiliated with judo, uh, engaged in challenge matches, worked in early pro wrestling, you know, which is, is different than the pro wrestling that we have today, obviously. Um, some of the matches, what we would call work, and some of them being real. Um, some challenge matches, um, the carnival thing. And frequently, because they didn't want to uh, impugn the reputation of Kano or his judo, and they did not want the consequences of perhaps judo, Kano finding out about them using the term judo and being angry with them, you know, for, for affecting their reputation, frequently they used the term jiu-jitsu. And so you see, like, matches which were advertised as wrestling versus jiu-jitsu, you know, catch wrestling versus jiu-jitsu. Um, you see boxing versus jiu-jitsu. Um, you see these uh, carnival challenge matches and stuff. really wasn't jiu-jitsu. It was pre-war judo. And this influenced the Gracie family. Um, in fact, it, when you look at stuff like um, the, the Closed Guard Project, like I said, um, the Gracie family themselves were not only involved in the challenge match angles, obviously, which everybody knows about, but were also involved in these sort of, you know, circus carnival pro wrestling kind of promotions and events. Oh, excuse me. So, it's not surprising that um, when we start looking closer at Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, we see how much of a relationship it has to pre-World War II Judo. I'm working for some notes here because I want to keep my focus. Um, Modern judo, as we know it now, obviously has the competition, um, the Olympics, which became a you know a, a big deal, and a, a passing acknowledgement of the self-defense aspect. Um, you know, judo still has its kata, and they have their their self-defense kata. But if you walk into most judo schools around the world, the emphasis is on the randori on the mat and the shiai, the competitions, including the Olympics. And there's only a passing acknowledgement. This is very different than um, pre-war judo. And I, I've discussed before about the fact that this is a reality that we have to accept because um, World War II changed everything because when Japan lost the war and the Americans occupied Japan, all martial arts schools were closed. Um, and anyone affiliated with Japanese militarism, you know, faced challenges about whether they would be allowed to um, continue their existence. So, pre-war judo was very different. Um, the competition was certainly there, um, and, you know, the, the emphasis at the core is, you know, the ability to do techniques live, um, throws, chokes, arm locks, back then there was leg locks, um, but very much more an emphasis on self-defense and combat. I always point out that competition shi'ai, um, which is written in 
Japanese kanji a certain way now. Uh, Kano sometimes wrote as mutual death, mutual death, because um, he wanted to stress that uh, the randori method was not just a quote unquote sport, but a way of making um, a classical martial art modern. And this will go back also a little bit when we talk about Shui Zhao, um, you know, the classical, you know, kind of ritual, recreational, quote unquote sport wrestling, and then, you know, allows them to also have um, police and military self-defense application. But judo became increasingly involved in the rising Japanese militarism. There is even a school of thought that Kano didn't die, but that he was poisoned or killed because he was uh, ambivalent and somewhat um, against incorporating you know, judo into uh, you know, military training and becoming involved in this rising militarism, and they wanted to get rid of him. We can find pictures of judo academies with racks of rifles in the background because um, in addition to doing Kano's judo, they were doing military training. Um, and again, this is similar to what was going on in China uh, when the central Guoshu was established, you know, a, an increased militarism. And we should never um, forget that the martial arts that we practice now went through this period of time when they were part of a militarism in China, an attempt to militarize and invigorate a society um, to make up for the you know, loss of position and the humiliations um, put upon it by the West. With roots in pre-war judo, it's not surprising to see that the Gracie family, um, when they evolved their methods, established three areas of study. And so the, the competition, you know, the rolling on the mat and, you know, the, the mats and um, leads eventually to the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Though, you know, famously or infamously, Elio walked out of the meeting saying that the way they were going to arrange it as a sport was contradictory, you know, with their points systems and everything to um, the way that he saw the necessary um, competitive, competitive element to the training. He was for the competitive element, obviously, but he was not in it for the sport, at least in the format that ultimately became the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. Self-defense. Um, in fact, Elio Gracie thought that the self-defense aspect was the most important aspect of Gracie family jiu-jitsu. And so when he had an opportunity to write a book, um, that master text that came out, it was not like... Um, you know, uh, spider web guards and a lot of uh, ground stuff. It was the self defense stuff. And we see now, um, you know, like I said, modern quote unquote Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of them have moved away from that tradition. But yet there's this um, urge to be returned to this tradition. You see it certainly with, um, you know, Hicks and Gracie. Um, with his invisible jiu-jitsu and, and Atkins, who's his student that does a, a version called hidden jiu-jitsu. We see it with the um, Horian Sons doing um, uh, programs also that bring back the combat, and you see you know, the, them you know, running the school the way that the family originally wanted jiu-jitsu to be taught. And of course, you know, the most controversial, the most famous, or the thing that really put the Gracie family on the map, so to speak, is the Valley Tudo or the challenge fighting. Um, which history and development of I said is somewhat linked to these um, challenge matches, somewhat linked to um, the history of pro wrestling and carnival fighting, none of which we should be taken as pejorative. We're just talking about the fact that a certain culture and ethic and aesthetic developed, particularly the early 20th century, that lent itself to creating you know, these challenge matches. Um, in Chang Shuizhou, Chang Deng Shui, Deng Cheng Shuizhou, we see similar aspects developing. Um, not surprisingly, uh, classical uh, Shuizhou, you know, uh, that was done by the Sampuyi, of course, was useful for combat. I mean, you would forget about the when they were in the streets and the jungle and the potential street. just picking somebody up and throwing them on the ground is a great combat skill. And, for example, you know, we have the, the Lei Tai competition where um, Wong Jiping won. Clearly his throws worked. He threw everybody and he won first place. But we also have that picture of him with the really, really bruised face. And I, I've, you know, talked about this before. 
that's because, you know, it was classical Shuijo. It was not what we think of now as combat Shuijo, developing methods um, both against the striking and using the striking to close the distance. But classical Shuijo could be used in combat. It was a good base for combat. It was a live training. And especially in Chinese martial arts, you know, that was a, a big, big deal because certainly a lot of other people were doing nothing but forms. Um, even in in the Central Guoshu Academy, this is a discussion here, like, they set it up originally to create combat, you know, capable and focus on combat application, but they got back into the mire, you know, the quicksand of forms, except in the Shui Jiao division and in the um, division that they created, which was sort of like um, Sino-sized boxing, Western boxing, but made almost like a Chinese martial art. With classical Shui Jiao as a base and uh, Bao Ding tradition, particularly being Chang's background, um, we start seeing developing, uh, among other uh, approaches, a kind of combat Shui Jiao, which is, you know, uh, like I said, entries both against strikes and using strikes. And we certainly see. Um, Chang utilizing striking as part of his method. Some of that probably came from his grandmaster, who went, like I said, when he established the Baoding Bao Ding School, um, incorporated, he said, you know, Shaolin Chuan. Some of it came from uh, striking methods for a generic that they taught at the Central Guoshu, uh, specifically Xing Yi, which, you know, um, People say, oh, you know, look at Chang Xing Yi, it's not orthodox. Yes, but from it, he developed striking methods, and the consensus is clearly that you did not want to get hit by Chang. Chang lineage Shui Zhou has the classical training, the stand up wrestling, which is why people from Chang's lineage are still able to go and compete in international Shui Zhou competitions. They will go to China and compete. But it also has a particular emphasis on self-defense. Particularly, you know, including the, the police techniques, which we call Daibushu. You know, um, and I'm going to get there in a minute. You know what I'm going to say about that. And challenge fighting, um, which nowadays we sort of refer to as Sanda. Um, you know, in Taiwan, it originally wasn't Sanda. There's some politics there. Um, increasingly, they've just sort of uh, gone with the flow and, you know, accepting and calling it Sanda, which is a kind of modern Valley Tudo style or challenge style of fighting. So you can see already how Shui Jiao has a lot of parallels going on. Um, this is why I think that a, a lot of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people would be interested in Shui Jiao, Cheng's lineage Shui Jiao, especially as we're offering in the Chinese Shui Jiao Association, you know, that we're now uh, opening up. Uh, and I think also, I'm going to talk about this, Shui Jiao people, particularly well, those that are interested in doing it as a martial art, not just as the classical recreation or ritual practice, would be interested in cross-training in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Today, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu people or Gracie Jiu-Jitsu people, um, cross-training with Judo is very popular. Um, it's completely understandable. I mean, you know, again, they're cousin arts to begin with. Um, they both are uniform grappling. Um, many Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu schools have excelled at the ground while being, you know, weaker certainly than Judo, you know, the modern Judo at the stand-up. Um, they've also trained in Western wrestling, clearly, especially for their, their no-gi. But um, keeping all the points in mind that I've discussed up to this point, uh, people particularly are interested in the original Gracie Jiu-Jitsu approach and in keeping that aesthetic and that those values, um, would, should maybe might consider, you know, my thesis here in talking to you, um, training in Shui Jiao. Since it's so close to the pre-war judo that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu came out of. And, in fact, Cheng's Shui Jiao um, 
is directly influenced by pre-war judo. So it's not just a, a coincidence or, you know, parallel development. Um, in the Central Goshu Academy, as I've mentioned many, many, many times, uh, pre-war judo was an influence. They sent people in 1930 to cross-train. Um, you know, uh, at this point, Chang was a student there. Uh, in 33, he became a member of the faculty, but he was training there. Um, we know that elements of pre-war judo and other Japanese martial arts were a great influence on the Central Goshu Academy, um, including, of course, the Shui Jiao program. Like Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, um, modern Cheng Shui Jiao has both uh, jacket and no jacket training. Um, I've been translating the police college material recently. Um, somewhat backlogged in that, but that's another story. And what's notable about it, of course, is, you know, not surprisingly, how it details with the jacket, this is how you grab. Without the jacket, this is how you grab. And if you look at um, Chang's manual, if you can find a copy of it, um, some of it's in a jacket and some of it's not in a jacket. Just like, um, you know, people doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Grace Jiu-Jitsu have gi and no gi. Furthermore, Shui Jiao jackets are, are short sleeve, meaning that um, Shui Jiao has always had a variety of useful techniques that work both with and without uniform, things like arm drags and, you know, arm manipulations and things like that. So, you know, um, I, I would argue that one of the advantages of Shui Jiao practicing stand-up with a jacket that is short sleeve is that you're getting sort of the best of both worlds. You have some elements in it that are clearly jacket wrestling. You have some elements in it that would be useful in wrestling without a jacket. Um, Shui Jiao, Chang style Shui Jiao also, un, you know, like pre-war judo as opposed to modern judo, does not have um, a lot of the restrictions on the grips and the methods of attack and attacking the legs. I mean, modern judo increasingly is restricted. Shui Jiao does not have that. Um, you can learn all kinds of very useful methods, which again, if you're used, interested in the uh, martial art aspect, are going to be very useful. In recent years, um, like I said, the, the combat Shui Jiao or, or Sanda has in many respects surpassed the early Gracie family Valley Tudo methods. Um, Sanda, you know, it became a, a very, not just developed in the military, but a very popular sport. Um, China became very interested in MMA. Um, people like myself. I, I mean, if you go back and look at the original Gracie tapes, and you go back and look at some of the stuff that the Gracie family was doing, there's nothing wrong with it. And I would still say do it. But... It's a smaller curriculum, is what my argument would be, and, you know, a little less developed. Um, the current Sanda program that we have um, for the Chinese Shui Jiao Association, I would argue, is a an excellent uh, supplement or complement if you're doing a, a martial-intended jiu-jitsu, like a Gracie family jiu-jitsu. Um, and, and again, like I said, you know, not all the schools, but clearly we know a lot of the schools, a lot of the jiu-jitsu schools, have uh, almost lost the um, these early kind of stand-up striking and, again, striking methods that the Gracie family developed for Valley Tudo. It's just, uh, you know, some of them are doing it, some of them are sort of like, you know, giving it that kind of... Uh, slight acknowledgement, the same way that modern judo is, you know, sort of winking at its self-defense aspect, but it's not a big focus. And it's rapidly being lost, and people like Hickson are, you know, concerned about this as well they should be. Um, but again, like I said, we also know that cross-training would not just benefit Gracie Jiu-Jitsu people, it would benefit us wage out people as well, and everybody knows I've trained in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, um, as well as a lot of other things. Um, our Daibushu, which is um, the police techniques, which is a Japanese term pronounced, you know, with by the Chinese, you know, because they're originally Chinese characters, is very influenced by pre-war Judo. It's a Japanese term. Um, but it's not as developed, obviously, as Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. It has some 
techniques where we bring people to the ground and pin them. Um, Master Jing showed some techniques where we follow up on the ground, but let's, you know, not delude ourselves into thinking that Shuijo has a well-developed ground program. You know, originally classical Shuijo has no ground, but Chang's has some because of the military and police application. But it, it needs to be, ground was never uh, correctly and completely addressed. And it should be if we want to give people a complete martial education. And so, you know, I, I guess my argument or my talking point here is that the association right now, the Chinese Shuizhou Association, is willing to, you know, open our doors and welcome in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu academies that would like to incorporate some of this training. And like I said, I think there's a lot of benefit for them. And in the process, you know, we would have access, obviously, to cross-training with them and improving ourselves as well. And um, as I've said in many occasions, in many different contexts, win-win situations win because they win for everybody. Um, for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academies, like I said, you know, you're already using uniforms. Um, you're already used to using belt systems. And when I'm talking about using uniforms, I mean, I know Shuijia uniforms are short sleeve, and most Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu are using, you know, similar to Judo uniforms, which is long sleeve. Um, as the current president of the association and the person, Chinese Shuijiao Association, and the person responsible for the curriculum development and the new membership programs, I think you could run a Brazilian, uh, run a Shuijiao program and a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu program and never change the uniforms. Um, learn how to do all the Shuijiao throws and techniques and Chinna and, you know, everything and just run it right alongside your. Um, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu program or your Gracie Jiu-Jitsu program. Uh, the sleeves are not going to make a huge difference. Um, and in fact, you know, like, like we set up the program so it's white, yellow, green, and blue. And most Jiu-Jitsu, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu programs go white and blue. So, I mean, if you condense the program down so that, you know, it was um, white, yellow, and green all in a quote-unquote white belt level, and then start blue material when somebody reaches blue belt in jujitsu, that would work also. Um, you know, uh, as I've said before, you know, I'm always dealing with issues of, uh, you know, uh, truth cannot be organized versus expedient means. So, the program that we uh, arranged is expedient means, it's not truth, and so therefore, if we modify it in any way, it's fine as long as we keep the idea of truth in, in the back of our minds, you know, as we do this. Um, and so, a along with this also, what I'm announcing is, um, uh, you know, our complementary, you know, subsidizing uh, parallel Shui Jiao Sanda program um, will be launching soon as well. And so, uh, if you're watching this and you're running a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu program or an academy, and you're saying, well, maybe I'd like to incorporate some Shui Jiao into my school, I'd like to say to you that if you join also, we will include the Sanda program that we're going to launch soon. In with that, which, you know, for you guys would be like a an MMA or a Valley Tudo um, supplement to your training. Uh, I, I've said, you know, in the letters that we first published when, you know, we reactivated the association and I took over the leadership, we're interested in friends and we're interested in uh, opening our doors and opening our arms. And so, uh, you know, we're not interested in keeping secrets. And so this is why, um, you know, we have done this and I think it's a great opportunity. And if you are someone, like I said, with a program or a school and you're interested in this, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm David Ross and welcome once again to the Lions Roar. And thank you for listening to me while I talked about the uh, potential relationship between Chang Shui Zhao and um, Brazilian or Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. Have a great night.